Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Time for us to begin our class this morning. We are going to be looking in, if you have your material, we'll be looking at Lesson 7. Considering some of the things that our material has to say there, uh, as we continue this discussion on apathy, uh, we're going to consider it from the standpoint of Revelation chapter 2. My Bible is open there if you want to turn yours there as well. Think about some of the words that Jesus says to the church at Ephesus. And I'll remind you, the church at Ephesus is a church that has been battling error for many years. And they are, they are formed in, in the midst of error. Ephesus is a very wicked city. There is a lot of pagan influence in the city of Ephesus. Uh, and, and they stand against it. They serve as lights in a dark place. And throughout the, the Bible, we have pictures in Ephesus of Paul speaking to them or speaking to people who are working there, encouraging them, fight the good fight of faith. Encourage them, be on guard against wolves. Over and over again, he uses language saying you need to be prepared for the battle because you're in the midst of a great spiritual battle. And so in Revelation 2, it should be no surprise to us that when Jesus speaks to him, he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Says, Everything that Paul warned you about, you took to heart and you fought that good fight. But listen to what he says in verse 4. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So somewhere in the midst of this great battle that's raging in Ephesus for truth and for, uh, for righteousness, you have a people who have grown apathetic. That, see, that is the purpose of this class. We, we can look at our lives and say, hey, it looks like we're, we're doing all of these right things, but have we left our first love? That's what we've been focusing on. We've been looking at ways that that can happen. We've been looking at things that might distract us from our walk with Christ. We've been looking at what it looks like to be apathetic and how it can become a very routine and a mechanical form of worship that we offer to the Lord and that our lives were just going through motions in many ways. What we're going to start looking at in this class today is the idea of rekindling that love. Rebuilding a love for God that we once had in the past. So that's what I hope that you all are, are ready to, to think about and to talk about. I'm going to have Brother Seth lead us in an opening prayer and then we'll begin. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you so very thankful for this beautiful morning that you've blessed us with. We're thankful, Father, for this time, for this opportunity that we have to come together and study your word. Father, we, we pray for Kyle this morning as he leads us in our thoughts. We pray, Father, that you will be with all of us, that we will leave the thoughts and the cares of the world outside, that we will focus on, on your word, and that we will focus on uh, gaining more knowledge of you. Father, we pray for all of our teachers this morning, uh, for all those who are leading our children and leading the classes. We pray you bless their efforts, Father. Father, we, we just thank you for all the blessings. Most of all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I guess to say just as part of, uh, of housekeeping, you notice our back TVs right here are, are not cooperating with us this morning. It's not going to be a big deal for you all because I don't have a PowerPoint. We're just leaving them on, hoping that they'll reconnect. Uh, if they don't, we're going to have to turn them off for our worship service, and everybody will just have to use the PowerPoint up front. Uh, but I hope that that won't be a distraction to anyone as we, as we go through our class. People who have lost their first love. That's what Ephesus looks like. If you were thinking through the Bible, what are some other characters that you might think of? Of people who at one time had a, a zeal, had a, a fire burning for the Lord, and then over time we see them later in their life looking like the, the fire is, is smoldering out. It's not what it once was. Cody. Yeah. 
Yeah, Cody brings up a great one. David, David really seemed to have a, uh, a fire burning in his youth. You know, he stands up. Dave, when I think of David, I always think of the boy with the mouth. And we, we know that because he wrote all these great poems. But we also know that because he stood in front of Goliath and said, the birds are going to pick your parts up from all over this battlefield. I mean, who says things like that? And he says that because he says, I know who my God is. I know my God's going to give me the victory. This is fire burning in him. And then later on, the same man who said things like that is on his roof looking, looking at, at, at women. And, and he's uh, looking at the men of his army and saying, I've got to count them to make sure I have enough people to be able to do this as opposed to that young man that one time said, God gives me the victory. So we see that fire changing over the years. It's a great one. What else? Jonah. Jonah. We have a picture of Jonah. Jonah is a, a prophet of God. Prior to the book of Jonah, we read about him being a prophet of God and working in the service of God. And then later in life, later in life in his story, we have a, a sense where his fire has, has been squelched a little bit. And he doesn't quite have the, the passion. And the reason for Jonah's apathy in this moment to, and, and it's, it's where apathy leads. It's almost to not even like the fire is, is died down. He dumped water on it and ran away from it. <laughs> he said, let's get as far away from what God wants me to do as possible. The reason for that was because of troubles in his life. Troubles in as, as political troubles in the nation. All of this, uh, and, and maybe even a, a sense of, of racism and bigotry. All of this piling on for him to go, I don't know that I, I don't know that me and God's Plans are in the same place anymore. That's a good one. Jonah, what else? Solomon. Solomon, much like David, he starts off, he starts off, you know, I'm, we're, we're going to build a house for God, a place for his presence to, to be in our midst. And, uh, and then very quickly, he says, and now we're going to build a house for me and a place for my presence to be in your midst. And, and very quickly starts to focus on himself. You got another one? Demas. How's Demas on this list? Well, he went back to the world. Went back to the world. He had a love for Christ that he had, he had left the world for, from, and Paul tells us later that he has returned to the Lord, or to the world. Of course, the whole nation of Israel, maybe just the majority of them, rather. Yeah. That, that characterized them. <clears throat> Israel as a whole, absolutely. Yeah. He just came in some, somehow, some way, and he believed because he was part of the, tw the 12. Yeah. And so he had some fire somewhere. He had some characteristic problems, which a lot of us do when we come to Christ. So somewhere along the line, instead of becoming more like Christ, he kept those and just built on those negative things. And talk about going through the motions. I mean, how many times did Judas see the motion of Jesus in trouble? Jesus is out of trouble. There's a crowd. Jesus walks through. Them. They want to throw him off a cliff. He just passes through their midst. How many times did he see things like that? And he may have, there may have been a sense where he's just going through the motions with, yeah, I'm going to make some money off this. I'll, yeah, I'll give him into your uh, 30 pieces of silver in my pocket. Jesus is going to walk right past you. It may have been that he, he that might be where, where his apathy led him. That's a good one. Uh, did I see another hand over here? What about Paul when he denied Christ three times? So Peter. Peter, Peter yeah, exactly. Peter, I think there's a picture of him as well. Uh, he is on fire. And, and at, at that, that fire builds up an arrogance in him. And, and we haven't talked a lot about that, about how apathy st can stem from arrogance. We've talked about how apathy can come from selfishness. And arrogance is a sense of selfishness where I'm focused on me. I'm focused on what I can do, what I think about myself. But that arrogance builds up in him a, a sense where he, his, his fire gets, gets really, you know, the damper's pulled down tight on it. And he, he runs from the Lord and weeping and bittering because of his denial. Any others? Well, we mentioned Israel. What about, what about the man from which Israel gets its name? What about Jacob? I think Jacob is an amazing picture of... The idea of apathy in our lives and our material uses 
uh, a little bit of that, we're going to draw, we're going to draw quite a draw several lessons and several ideas from, from Israel's life, or I should say from Jacob's life. Uh, in Genesis 28, what happens? Who, who recalls that? Maybe as you're preparing for the class or what, what occurs in Genesis 28 to Jacob? Is that where he rests the Lord? So close, close. We're, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. This is where he has just left. He has just left home. He has deceived his dad. He has received the birthright. His brother wants to kill him. And his mom says, you've got to get out of here, boy. And so he's running. <clears throat> And what happens? He gets to a place called Lutz or Luz. Y'all remember what happens there? Genesis 28 talks to us about Jacob's dream. Jacob has a dream here. It says that he departed Beersheba. He went down towards Haran. He came to a certain place. He spent the night there because the sun had set. He took a stone and put it under his head to lay, in that, lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And if you'll recall, that dream consisted of a ladder with angels ascending and descending to, to heaven. And there are words in this dream as well that stand out. Behold, the Lord stood above the ladder and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your, to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. What does that sound like, what God says to him there? Does this sound like anything that he said before in the past? Is this the first time we've ever heard words like this? We've heard him say things like this before. Who did he say them to? Abraham. Abraham. He said it to Abraham. He said it to Isaac. This is his covenant that he has made with Abraham, that he has repeated each generation with the person who's going to carry that covenant forward. God is saying, I'm, I'm still being faithful to my covenant. I haven't finished what I promised to finish. I'm, I'm still doing that, and I'm going to continue doing it through you. And if you recall, Jacob awakes from this dream, and it says that he is afraid, he is fearful, but he, is, he says, this is an awesome place. That fear is an awe-filled fear. As he wakes up and he realizes the magnitude, I am in the presence of God. In fact, he says, surely this is the house of God. And so he changes the name of that place, you remember? Bethel. House of God. Bethel. House of God. He changes the name of the place to Bethel. And then he says this. He wakes from his sleep. He arises early in the morning. He gathers his stuff up. He, he takes the, uh, the stone and he pours oil on top of it. And he says, God, if you will be with me, verse 20, if you will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, the Lord will be my God. The stone which I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of that you give, and of that you give me, I will give to you a tenth. So he says, God, first of all, he wakes up and he says, this is, this is a holy place. The presence of God is here. This is awesome. And God, you're going to be my God. If you're going to do what you said you're going to do to me, if you're going to take care of me, you're going to bring me back here. If you're going to do those things, then I am going to be your person. I'm going to belong to you and I'm going to worship you and I'm going to sacrifice to you. But you are going to be my God. He is in this moment, on fire. God has lit a fire under Jacob and he is excited about where he's going and it's all about God. It's all focused on God. But then you get to Genesis 35. In Genesis 35 paints a little bit different picture of Jacob. In Genesis 35, God has to tell Jacob you need to come back to Bethel. It says in verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled away from your brother Esau. It says it's time for you to go back. But he is not going back as he left. What are some things that are different about Jacob in Genesis 35 that were not true of him in Genesis 28? 
He is married. Yes, he's got two wives. And not only is he married, what else does he have? He has a herd, not just of animals. He is a very wealthy man, but he has a herd of children. He has got children with his two wives. He has got children with concubines. He has got several children. He has got a family. Or what else? We might say he has got great responsibilities. A lot of responsibilities. The, the Jacob that we saw in chapter 28 has no responsibilities. It's only him. And he only cares for him. And he has shown that his entire life. It is all about me and about what I can get for myself. And he is running from his sins. He is running wild in the wilderness. And God reaches out and says, I am here and I want you and I'm going to take care of you. And he says, then I belong to you, God. Is that not our story, by the way? When you stop and think about that, is that not who we were? We didn't care for anybody else. It was about us. We lived for us. And in that, God reached out and says through His Gospel, I gave everything for you and I want you. And I'm drawing you. And you say, you you hear that and you respond with fire. You respond with, that's what I want to be, God. I want to be buried with that. I want to be rising up out of the water with that. I want to walk and I want to give back to you with everything that you have given to me. I want to do that in return. Genesis 35, we see a very different Jacob. He's got a lot of other things on his mind. He's got a lot of people that he has to mouth to feed. And I've got to figure out what to do with all this wealth and how to keep it and how to protect it and how to be a good steward of it. And... I've got all of these relationships that I have to nurture. And not only that, I've got some past that's not been very easy. I've been through some hard things. So when he goes and God says, you come back to Bethel, notice what he says. In verse 2, Jacob said to his household, to all who are with him, put away your foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves. And change your garments. Now, do you remember? He said, God, if you, will, if you will give me garments, I will worship you. Now he's saying, not only do, have we exchanged our garments, we've put on different garments, we need to take those off. We've become unclean. We're, we're, we're not prepared to be in the presence of God. And not only that, all this about He's going to be our God, Maybe, maybe Jacob has kept some of that. But certainly the family that he, is, that he is now leading through the wilderness has been influenced and is following after other gods. We see that earlier in their story where those gods come from, from Jacob's father-in-law. They steal those from him. That has been a part of their lives. They're going to take that with them. and Maybe has been influencing Jacob some as well. So Jacob looks very different. And God reaches out to him at a time when he looks very different. And he really says three things to him. That's what I want us to to picture through the rest of this class. He says, Jacob, remember. Jacob, repent. And Jacob, restart. You remember Bethel. And you need to turn from where you are and you need to come back to Bethel. And then he says, build an altar there. If you recall, that's exactly what he said he was going to do. That's exactly what he said. He says, you need to restart the work you did in the beginning. You need to remember. You need to repent. You need to restart. And as we talk about rekindling our first love, the message hasn't changed for us today. The message is just the same. When we realize that I have gotten a ways away from Bethel, I've gotten a ways away from the house of God, and life has been hard, and life has been difficult, and and I've got new responsibilities, and I am a different person than I was then. We need to hear God's message when He reaches out and says, it's time to come back to Bethel and build an altar. It's time to remember. It's time to repent. It's time to restart. So we're going to consider some things about that as we go through the remainder of class. The first one is, why should we do that? Why should we even care? I mean, Jacob's life is pretty good right now. Like he's... He does have a concern. He's got a pretty big meeting that's in front of him. And the guy that he's going to meet might kill him. So, I mean, he's got some problems in his life. But he's got a big family. He's got a lot of wealth. He's got a lot of, uh, you know, 
building influence as you have a larger family, you have influence because you, you have the ability to impact the region that you go into. So he's building influence. He's building wealth. Things look like he's prospering. Why would he listen to God? Why would he even want to go back to Bethel? And why should we want to remember, repent, and restart? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. God's the reason he has everything he has. God's the reason. I mean, he has been blessed in everything that he has done. And there may be a sense in which Jacob doesn't quite see that yet, because Jacob, whose name, if you recall, is the deceiver, the tricker. He's he's pretty cunning. And there's a sense where he may say, hey, look, my good business deals, my cunning uh, ability to, to, to reason through how things are going to happen. You remember all the sheep? I'm the one that came up with the scheme to figure out how the sheep are going to give birth to this or that and, and really padded my, my pocketbook with that. You remember how I did that with, with mom and dad or with, with dad and my brother? I mean, you remember how I did that? I did those things. There may be a sense where he has a hard time seeing it, as we all sometimes do. Talked about in a previous class about how I, I had a hard time seeing it as a young man. I said, I worked for that money, Holly. That's the money that I made in my job. At the end of the day, where did all that come from? In Jacob's life and my life and all of our lives, it's a blessing from God. It comes from him. So in part, why do we want to go back? Because, because God is the reason we have anything that we have. We, of course we should want to return to him. What other reasons? Boom. Gold star from Miss Carol up here. First John chapter four is my, what I got wrote in my notes is what I was on my way over to read. First John chapter four in verse 19. What does he say there? We probably don't even need to turn over there to read it. We love because he first loved us. God loved Jacob. He will even say that later in a way that it, it even draws to our minds the, this strange notion about who God is when he says, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I have hated. He said comparatively, comparatively to the things that I have done for Jacob, it, it doesn't compare to, to, to Esau's life. You can't, you can't say, well, like, oh, well, I think he liked one better than the other. No, you have to look at their lives. You have to say he loved Jacob and he must have hated Esau to the things that he did for them. He says, I love you, Jacob. And I'm going to show that even at a time when you don't deserve it. You've been acting completely against my character. You're not my sort of people, but I love you. And I'm going to enter into a covenant with you. And I'm going to provide for you. And I'm going to be your God. You loved him. Why return to Bethel? Because that's where God first showed him his love. Why return to our first love? Because he loved us. Because he's given us when we didn't deserve. We go, Romans 5. We were enemies. We weren't deserving of that. To say, for a good man we might consider. You might think about, like, okay, okay, maybe, maybe I'll give my life to this person because they're, they're respectable. Maybe I'll give this life for this person because that's going to, boy, so, somebody's going to talk good about me because they were such a good person. They say, oh, <clears throat> he says, we weren't that. We were enemies. We're the enemy of God and He gave His life for us because He loved us. John 3.16, He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Throughout Scripture, we're finding that picture. God is love. As His apostle would tell us later. Kyle, yes, ma'am. God is always there. He never changes. If there's a, a drift between us and God, it's because we have moved. Absolutely. He never changes away from that. He is always love. He is always there. And whenever we start recognizing the relationship is not what it used to be, the fire is burned low. The fire is burning low in our lives. We can't look at that and say, well, God, you're just not doing your part anymore. We've moved away from the source. We've moved away from His love. And so... That's the reason why we want to rekindle this. That's the, the true reason. And even what Cody mentioned, because he gives us all these things. Why does he do that? Why does he give us those things? Because he loves us. That is what's at the heart of all of it, is God's love. So why rekindle? Why remember, repent, restart? Why do that? Because he loves you. Because he has poured his love out in great ways. Whenever we think of grace, I had a, I had a, um, a very influential man in my life who used to tell me, he says, grace... 
He said that he'd tell me a story about a bridge with a net underneath it. These guys were working on the bridge and, and there was a net that went underneath that bridge. So if anybody fell off as it spanned this, this great river, as it fell off, you worship with him. You ever heard Troy tell this story? Troy ever told this to you? Troy. So he said there's these guys working on the bridge and one day the foreman comes out and all the guys are on the, on the nets with their hands behind their leg. I got my, my the button's button. I can't do it. He's got his hands behind his head and they're all lounging, eating their, their shakes and they're on this big uh, net like it's a, a trampoline. <clears throat> and the guy comes out and he's like, what are you doing? You don't get off to that. You, you don't play with that. That's to keep you safe. But you don't play with it. He says that's the grace of God. The grace of God is something that it's, it's God's love for us. And he puts that there to keep us safe and to bring us into safety. We don't need to play with that. And so when we recognize, we recognize, hey, fire's burning low. I'm out here on the net. I'm out here bouncing around and I need to get back to God's love. I need to get off that and get back to work. I need to get off that and get back to my, to my boss, to my master, to my Lord. I need to get back to serving him. We need to rekindle it. And that's the reason why, because he first loved us. But it's hard. It is so hard to get the fire going again. You notice that sometimes when, when you go to, to build a fire and then something has happened, maybe you, know, you, you wake up in the morning and it rained overnight. Or there was a really heavy dew. Everything's wet. It's really hard to get the fire started again. Even though at one point it was burning really great, and now all of a sudden it's like there ain't enough fuel for me to get it going, I can't blow enough to get that thing stoked back up. I, just, I can't get it started. Why is it so hard sometimes to get the fire burning in our life again? We recognize, okay, I, I, remember, what, I remember where it was, and I want to repent, and I want to restart things, but it's really hard to get that started. Why do you think that is? Satan. So Satan. Satan is a, is a big reason for that. What are some ways that Satan, Satan does? What are some things that Satan does to, to hinder that process? Yeah. So one of the things that Satan does, housed in those three things, is he put things in front of you. He will put things in front of you to try to say, you know, like lust of the flesh, lust of this. God loved you, but if you go back to that, you have to give up this. You have to, or how about this one? If you go back to God, you have to admit to yourself, to God, and maybe to others that you have not been as strong as you thought. And they, they're not going to think of you the same. They say they're going to love you. They say that the church is all about it. They're going to think, they're going to think bad thoughts about you. They're going to think that you should have known better. They're going to shake their head and say, oh, can't believe that he did that. I don't know that I can look at him the same anymore. Pride of life. He puts those thoughts in front of us and says, think about that. And it makes it hard to return to the Lord. It's a good one. Satan works in those ways. There are some other ways that he, that he makes this hard for us. Family influence. It's a family influence. Elaborate a little bit further. Uh, they tell you that you don't need to go to church God's dead and everything else. Yeah. So I think in, in connection to that, one of the things that Satan does is he makes us forgetful. He makes us... So we, we want to remember. We want to remember who God is. We want to remember the love that He has. We want to remember where we were when we were close to Him. We were on fire. And He makes us forgetful of that. One of the ways He does that is through family and through influence and through people. Maybe it's not even family. Maybe it's close friends. But putting people into our lives that are going to to challenge those memories. You don't really think it really wasn't that way. It really wasn't that good. Why would you even want to? You know, you're just you're just doing what you should do because God really either God, he loves everybody. He doesn't care what you do or God's not real. Why are you wasting your time with this? He causes us to be forgetful. And not only can that be forgetful in that way, I think we become forgetful in in much you know, we, we look at that and go, oh, I think we, well, a lot of times, especially for us in here this morning, we probably have these blinders on where if you've got a friend that comes up and says, hey, God's not real, their influence on you all of a sudden just went way down. Like, okay, I, I know that this person right here doesn't know what they're talking about. So I, I'm not really going to be too concerned with the things that they say to me. But we also get forgetful in 
in other ways that seem less, they seem less impactful, but they, but they are. We talked about those distractions. Those things that, uh, you know, entertainment and work and hobbies and these things that distract us. But they make us forgetful. We forget what God really offers and we focus on what they offer. We can forget that way, Luke. So tying into the forgetfulness um, and back to the fire analogy, when you have to recreate the atmosphere for the fire to burn, right? Sometimes we have to restack up the wood or remove the coals around to introduce all those elements to create, get that fire back up, right? We can take that, we can apply that across the board. If you go to the gym for five years and you work out hard and you build up this good physique and then you quit for six months, you go back to the gym again. It's really hard. It's really hard. You're able, to, you're able to get back in the groove. So there's a lot of effort that goes back into getting back to where we were. And sometimes that effort seems like this hill is impossible. Um, you sit there thinking, man, I used to be really good at this. I used to be able to bench this. I used to be able to hit that ball just right. Whatever. Um, it, it gets a little depressing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you try to get back into it, you're like, man, this zill used to be so much. What happened to me? Am I going to be able to get there again? Again, and that's the devil. But uh, it takes work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11, it, it, it takes work and it's a real issue. And so Deuteronomy 8, verse 11, God tells the Israelites. Like if this wasn't a problem, this wasn't something we shouldn't be aware of, God wouldn't talk about it. God tells the Israelites, do not forget your Lord. He said, well, that won't ever be a problem for me. He said, it was a problem for them. It seems to have been a problem for Jacob. It is a problem that makes it very hard for us to turn back to him. We've forgotten who he is. We've forgotten his love. We've forgotten the things that he led us in and the way that we, we felt in those moments and the way that we experienced his love in those ways. We forget those things. It makes it very hard. You know, another reason I have that it makes it hard is we're, just, we're very fickle people. You ever notice that? We just yeah. we flip around all the time. You say, oh, I, I believe this way and then the next thing I believe that way. And maybe not so much on theological things, but just in our lives in general. We didn't change our minds a whole lot. <clears throat> I mean, it might be some of you here. How many times you change your mind getting dressed this morning? Sounds like politics. It does sound a lot like politics. And, you know, that, that happens. The, the, what, what, even the, the different parties that we, that we predominantly see in our country today, they've stood for different things as you go throughout history. They've, they're fickle as well. They flip back and forth. Do you think that the idols that Jacob says you all get rid of, do you think that they did anything to show their commitment to Jacob like Yahweh did? You think the idols ever said, hey, here, here's a dream of what we're going to offer you. And here's our words to tell you how we're going to take care of you. And we're going to love you even though you're not very lovable right now. And we're going to be your God. No, the idols never did that. And yet, Jacob went from someone who is on fire for God. Now he's, he's flip-flopped. And he's doing the very opposite of somebody who loves God. He's loving false gods. He's following after them. And maybe that's a bit of his craftiness. Maybe that's a bit of his um, opportunistic sort of mentality. And he's, he's searching for the opportunity and things. And when you do that, you see somebody who is, is very crafty in business. Or even in a, a geopolitical world, uh, you, you see countries who build alliances with someone because it benefits us right now. And then as soon as it stops benefiting us. We come over here, we build alliance over there, we flip-flop. Because we're, we're fickle. We're, we're prone to, to, to bounce back and forth. We're all about God. And we're all about God when life really gets in our face. When life really gets in our face, we're all about God and we pray really, really hard. And we open His Word up and say, make sense of this and bring, bring your Word into my life. And we go, I want to be with his people. And I, I, I want someone to build me up. And I, I want to have a use. I, I want to see that I still have a purpose, even though life is hard right now. And so I want to go and I want to help somebody else. And then things get easy. And all of a sudden, life isn't really up in our face anymore. It's taking a step back. And what we do, we get real fickle. All that praying, all that praying and all that Bible study and all that <clears throat> closeness and fellowship with God's people... All of a sudden, it's not as important anymore. That takes a back seat. That makes it really hard for us to get the fire going again. It doesn't make it impossible, but these are things that, that get in the way. They make it difficult. I think another one, as we, you know, we're running out of time quicker than I thought we would, 
Another one is just the fact that life is hard. Life is hard. We don't live. We don't live in a world where when the fire goes out overnight, you wake up the next morning and there's dry wood and there's a, you know, a, an oily rag right here just ready to be lit up. And, and you've got all, you know, you've got a propane torch in your hand and you're just ready like, hey, we can get this going again like that. We live in a world where it rains on us. We live in a world where sometimes it pours and we're not prepared for it. We weren't, we weren't expecting it. And all of a sudden, that's where we are. That's the situation we're in. How do I get the fire going again? Jacob lived in that world. He lived a hard life. Yes, at this point, it look, things look like it's going good for him, but he's left home. There's no reason to believe Jacob ever saw mom again. There's no reason to believe that he ever... She says, Jacob, you've done this thing. Your brother, your brother's going to kill you. You go. That may have been their last conversation. He comes back home, and what he finds is Esau. And yes, they have a good thing, but he's coming back to that in this moment. This hasn't happened yet. He's coming back to that going, Esau's probably going to kill me. My brother is probably going to kill me. And I've got to figure out, I've got to figure out what to do about that. He went and he worked. He found the love of his life. He goes, he finds a girl, says, oh, this is the one for me. He goes to her dad and says, can I, can I marry your daughter? And he says, sure you can. You've got to work seven years though. And he works and he works and he works. And wedding night, that ain't my bride. Who is this? That's her sister. I didn't work for her. Well, you know, in our culture, you have to marry her first. It's going to take another seven years to get your, the one you really wanted. Now, he, is, he has lived a hard life. There's been a lot that has happened for between, between 28 and 35. And life being hard makes it difficult. Yeah. It makes it difficult to get the fire burning again. Paul tells us we're in a spiritual warfare every day. Whatever. You read the class, didn't you? I read you're taking, the you're class. taking all, you're taking all my notes. notes. Yes. You're taking all my notes. Is it time to go on to the next subject? It's close, <laughs> well, I'm, but I'm just going to let you do it. I'm just going to let you teach it because you read the notes. You read my notes. We're, we have battle fatigue. We get in spiritual warfare. And people let us down. People that we, I remember, I remember the first church that ever had elders that I was a part of. And I mean, I was on cloud nine. I said, why don't every church have elders? This is, this is, I didn't know that this is what I was missing. I didn't know that this is what that looked like. And I, I don't know why we don't have that. That is the best thing. Until they make a decision that rocks you to your world. And you go, I don't, I don't know that that's scriptural. And it's battle fatigue. It's battle fatigue. You, be, you become, why does Paul write to the Galatians and say, don't grow weary in doing good? Because we grow weary in doing good. We grow weary in this spiritual battle and we experience battle fatigue. All of these things come together and we need refreshment. We need to build the fire back up. But we struggle with it because all of these things stand in the way. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David, we talked about him earlier. David came to a point in his life, he said, I need to be renewed. And it's not going to happen because I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm just going to be a self-made man and renew my heart. He said, God, I need you to renew me. I need you to restore me. Please create that in my heart. And we need to see that as well. We need to see that we need to rekindle that first love because God first loved us. We need to see that it is hard. We need to see that there are things that stand in the way. We need to also remember God can make it happen. And so if we heard Jesus come to us today, if Jesus came and said, Southside Church of Christ, I see how you all don't stand for error. You all are fighting for the truth. And there are those who have, have promoted error in the past and you've said, no, nope, we, we don't believe that and you shouldn't be teaching that and we stand against it. But you, I have this against you, Southside Church of Christ. You've left your first love. Hear those words of your Savior. So it's in the song, Sweetly Lord, do you hear we call it? That, that's not a very sweet calling, is it? Those words don't fall tenderly upon our ears. You have left your first love. What do you do next? Revelation 2.5 says this. 
Remember from where you were fallen. Repent. Do the deeds you did at first. Or in other words, restart. How do we practice that? I want to give us just a few ways as we run out of time, a few ways that we can begin practicing that in our lives. Um, one is we begin practicing that those three R's. Remember, repent, restart. Begin practicing that in your prayer life. So what's something you might remember about prayer? Say it again, Miss Carol. Something you remember about prayer? Yeah, yeah. We're talking to our Father. So we're talking to our Father. We're talking to Him who created us. We're talking to Him who when we had gone and joined ourselves to the world to become children of the world, adopted us back in. He is our Father. And we're talking to Him. That's a great thing to remember. What's something else you might remember about prayer? It's a necessity. It's a necessity. This is something that we need. And thus when Paul says things like pray without ceasing, it's something almost as if somebody say, hey, breathe without ceasing. Like it's something you need. You need to be doing that. You need to be involved in that to, to live and to thrive. What else? Well, you know, when you became a Christian, you was in a period of life when you wanted to be close to God. Yeah. So your thoughts and your prayers and your emotions and I want to get close to God. That's what you have fallen from. Yeah. Your prayers need to focus. Remember where you have fallen. That was what you wanted at the start. It's a really That's good point. Lost, your prayers should focus on getting you back. Yeah, remember the reason for your prayers was you wanted to be close to God. And oftentimes we still, we still pray, even though maybe we've left our first love, we still pray. But what do those prayers look like? They don't look about being one to be close to God. They look sometimes about just, well, I want this, I want this, I want this. Where is the thankfulness? And where is in, in the I need, in the supplement, uh, supplication, when they say, I, I need your help, God. We're saying this because we want to be close to him. Hebrews chapter four says that uh, God or Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 through 16 says that we have a high priest, that Jesus is our high priest and we can go before his throne of grace and mercy in a time of help. That idea that Rogers brings up, go before we can go near to the God of heaven and find help in our time of need. <clears throat> Remember that and then repent, repent in a sense we need to come to the conclusion, God, my prayer life has become archaic. As in, that's something that happened in ancient history. It's not something that happens anymore. It has become foreign to me. When Israel couldn't speak the tongue of Israel anymore, they spoke the tongue of the people around them. It was a sad thing. Has my prayer life become foreign to me? I don't speak to God anymore. And I don't even know if I remember how to do it. Repent of that. Go to God and confess that. And then restart. Restart Regular communication with God. And we talked about pray without ceasing, but Philippians 4, 6 also says, uh, also says for us to, to pray in all things. That we give thanksgiving, things are going well, we also pray in anxiety. We pray in all things. Just restart this communication with God. Um, we also want to think about remembering Bible study. Some passages that I had in mind, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that God's Word is able to pierce through division of, of joint and, and marrow, soul and spirit. But when I think about this, let there be light. The power of those four words God spoke that created everything and started all of this. What's the power of these words? Like I have an opportunity to join in to the mind of God when I read His Word. Remember the power of God's Word and repent. It might be that I repent before God and say, God, I haven't treated Your Word with honor and with reverence. It might be that I repent in front of my family and say, guys, we've not been doing this. And I'm leading or I, I play a part in, 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 in helping us do this better and we've not been doing it. And it's not right. It's time for us to make an about face. It's time for us to turn and go back to that which we did in the beginning. It's time for us to restart using God's Word as a lamp to our feet, as a light to our path. And lastly, I would say, what about our worship? What about our worship? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 reminds us what our worship is to be a living sacrifice. Do we remember that? Do we remember what our worship to God is? His lives that have been given to Him. Given to Him in service in the world and in His field. Given to Him in service through the fruit of our lips and in praise. But they are given fully to Him. 
We remember what that felt like one day. In our past, we gave it all to him. We need to repent of that. Repent of how we have not given it all to him today and restart. Restart that in our lives. Guys, thank you all so much. I know we ran out of time. Lesson 8 is where we will uh, begin on Wednesday, and John should be back for that lesson. Uh, spiritual lethargy and erosion of faith. So if you want to look over those notes and be prepared for that class, I know he'll greatly appreciate it. I appreciate your all's help today. Thank you all.